Hi, and welcome to the Canvas Church Podcast, where you can listen to our weekly sermons. Thanks for joining us on this journey as we look to God's Word to mold us into people becoming the church. You can be seated. Hi, this is Hal Donaldson with Convoy of Hope, and I just want to say thank you for your partnership as together we meet physical and spiritual needs in the name of Jesus. Please know that everything we do is in partnership with local churches. Globally, we're feeding and discipling over 600,000 children each school day. And in 2024, we also trained and educated more than 50,000 women and girls, and we help many mothers start their own businesses so now they can feed their own children. And we train more than 35,000 farmers and families in agriculture, discipling them, but also helping them increase the yields of their crops. We also responded to more than 80 disasters in the U.S. and around the world. Most recently, together we responded to Hurricane Celine and Milton. To date, more than 200 truckloads of food, water, and emergency supplies have been distributed to over 300,000 survivors in the Southeast. We've worked alongside 100 churches in over 100 communities. Thank you for making that possible. And please know this, we plan to be working in the disaster zones for many months to come, helping families put their lives back together. Now in the United States, there are 42 million people that are living under the poverty line. The majority of them are working poor families that are food insecure. And that means that children are going to bed hungry and families are being forced to skip meals. And so we're partnering with urban and rural churches across the country to address this growing need. A regional distribution center has been opened on the West Coast and early next year, we'll open a distribution center in Atlanta to serve the Eastern half of the United States. In addition, we have recently broken ground to build a manufacturing packaging facility to increase the amount of food that we have at our disposal to distribute through churches. This facility has the potential to produce one billion meals each year. But again, thank you so much for partnering with Convoy of Hope to break the cycle of poverty and to let children and families know that Jesus loves them. But thank you so much for your kindness and your compassion. God bless you. Well, good morning, Campus Church. Man, I'm so pumped to share with you this morning that last week in our one-day offering, we gave the biggest offering we have as a church through Convoy of Hope. So our, 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 high, our, our high watermark was $16,000, and as of Monday, we are at $18,605.72. It is such an honor and a joy to be able to partner with Convoy of Hope. They are such an incredible organization that can take our $1 and turn it into $7. And I'm not about to do the math on $18,605.72 times seven, but I just want you to know it's a very big number. And it's because you are a generous church. And I love being a part of a generous church who recognizes there's needs across the street and around the globe that we can show up and together we have more horsepower to do more than we could ever do by ourselves. And I love partnering with Convoy and I love partnering with Bryant Elementary. So together as a church, we did an incredible thing this last week and maybe you're here this morning and you're like, oh, I totally forgot about last week. I wasn't here, didn't get a chance to give the way I wanted to. Well, good news, (laughs) you still can. Inside of your bulletin, there's a QR code. You could use one of the giving boxes out in the back. Just mark your your check. Uh, One day to feed the world, make it out to Canvas and drop it in there. And we'll make sure that every dollar leaves our facility and impacts kids and families around the globe. Now, if you're a guest this morning, like Adam already said, and I haven't had the chance to meet you, super glad that you're here today. Thanks for hanging out with us on your Sunday. You've carved out a little bit of your weekend to spend with us, and I believe that it's going to be impactful for you. So glad that you're here. I'd love to meet you in the lobby afterwards. Uh, After the gathering, I'll be out there. I'd love to shake your hand and get your name. My name's Nate, and I get to be a part of the team here at Canvas Church. And it's clear I love what Jesus is up to here at Canvas. Now, it is Christmas season officially. You know why? Thanksgiving's done. And now we can move on to Christmas. How many of you guys excited to celebrate Christmas? Man, 
I get a bad rap because I like to wait till after Thanksgiving and people think I'm kind of a Grinch. But I got to tell you that Easter, uh, Easter, Easter is one of my favorites as well. Christmas is one of my favorite seasons of the year. Can you give a great applause to those who did the decorating around the church? Heidi and Amy, they decorated the place up. Looking good, got it all ready for us to jump into our new series. It's a Christmas series. It's called Christmas in Focus. Now, Christmas has so much to it, doesn't it? It's just busy. There is so much going on with Christmas. I mean, there's lights, and there's shopping, and there's presents, and there's wrapping, and there's movies. How many of you guys have already been jumping into some Christmas Hallmark movies? Don't be shy. Throw them hands up. Okay. All right. And then there's Christmas music starting today. Christmas music can start for me. Like I'm ready. I'm, I'm good for a month and then it's, I'm, I'm ready to move on, you know, but Christmas has so much to it, doesn't it? Like it's easy. And I hear this often. It's just easy to bemoan the busyness that comes along with Christmas. There's just so much to it. And I hear year after year, guilty of saying it myself, we just need to simplify Christmas. Let's strip it down. Let's take away all of, the, all of the crazy around it. But if I'm honest, part of what I love about Christmas is the crazy. I love the food. I love the festivities. I love all that goes around. So as a teaching team, we decided to ask a different question this year. So often we ask, how can we strip back Christmas? How can we simplify it? Instead, we asked a different question this year. We asked the question, what if we embrace the busy without losing the focus? What if we embrace the busyness of the season? What if we enjoyed all of the festivities rather than bemoaning it, but we embraced it without losing the focus of Christmas? If we embrace the busy while losing focus, then that's a real problem. Then it just becomes a commercialized holiday for big box stores to make a bunch of money. But what if we embraced the busy without losing focus? We kept our focus exactly where it's supposed to be. So that's really the goal of this series. For the next four weeks, we're going to be walking through together and trying to help us keep our focus where it matters, on the focal point of Christmas. So I want you to take a look at this while I grab my table, and then we're going to dive in together. As you can see, if you have your notes this morning, that we've titled this message, A Promise Made. A Promise Made. We titled it this way because the focal point of Christmas began with a promise. The focal point of Christmas began with a promise. Now, I think it's safe to say that we all have an interesting and likely complicated relationship with promises, don't we? Promises that have been made and kept, promises that have been made and broken. We've had those promises given to us. We've made those promises to others. So it's safe to say in here today, if we were to survey everybody by asking you to raise your hands, which we won't, but there's a good chance most of the hands would go up in this place, that we have a complicated relationship with promises. A clear example of this, and it's quite honestly, it's low-hanging fruit, but I think it's a very current example, so applicable to us this morning is the last few months that we just walked through as a nation as we led up to a up to a presidential election. As we worked our way through a presidential race, there were a lot of promises made, weren't there? 
I mean, that's what politicians do. That's how they campaign. They make promises in as a, as a culture, as a, as a country, we vote in who we think we like their promises or they are best equipped to keep their promises. That's what we do. Now, here's a fun statistic for us this morning that should lower, like, lower the general temperature around our elections. No president ever in the history of our country have kept all of their promises. Shocker. <laughs> so like, if you're super jacked in this place this morning because of what just took place, it's probably not going to be as good as you were hoping. If you're super bummed in this place because of what just took place, probably not going to be as bad as you thought it was going to be. Like, that's just, I'm, I'm only 47. Not a lot of times around the sun, but I've been around the sun enough to know that it's generally not nearly as good, nearly as bad as anybody's thinking. So when it comes to promises and presidential elections, man, they all let us down in some form or fashion. No one has ever fulfilled all of their promises. And we have all, like I've already said, we have all been on the other side of unkept promises, haven't we? Somebody's made a promise to us, and they didn't come through on it. And the truth of the matter is, we've all been the one who has made promises and not come, th come through on our end of the promise. It almost happened to me this last week around Thanksgiving. I know. Micah, our youngest, he had bought a game called Clue. Pretty excited to play it. One night they got the game out, him and some friends and, and his brother, and they were sitting down to play. And it was like 11 o'clock at night or something. I was like, you guys are going to jump into Clue like right now? It's super late. And they were all like, yeah, let's not play. Micah was bummed. He's like, oh, man, I've been wanting to play this so bad. And I was like, okay, dude, tomorrow I will play Clue tomorrow with you. Ethan jumped in. He's like, I'll play Clue with you tomorrow as well. Well, tomorrow rolled around, and lo and behold, I, wasn't, I was as excited as I was the day before to play Clue on that day, <laughs> and I, I, I was starting to think of excuses as why we should not play, but then I remembered, you made a promise. You said yesterday we were playing Clue tomorrow, so we sat down and played, and I got to tell you, super fun game. If you're looking for a game option for somebody this Christmas season, Clue is a great option. So we've all been on it, right? We've been on the, the raw side. Somebody didn't fulfill a promise. We've been on the side of making a promise and not coming through on our promise. And often what I've discovered, not always, but oftentimes promises are made with the best of intentions, aren't they? Like really desire, like I'm, I'm promising to do this because I really desire to do it. But often those same promises are broken because there's a lack of means to fulfill the promises. That's just a reality. I remember my parents making promises to me as I grew up. And when the time came for them to come, come, come good on their promise, they just didn't have the means to fulfill it. Promise came and went. So promise made with great intentions, but with a lack of means to fulfill it, the promise was unkept or unmet. But I got good news for you this morning. That's not the case with God. God, when he makes a promise, he comes through on his promise because he has the means to fulfill his promise. And my hope is by the end of our time together, we're going to walk through the scriptures. We're going to just do a, a, a rapid survey of the scriptures. And my hope is by the end of our time together today that you will recognize that God promises and God delivers. When God makes a promise, we never have to wonder, is he going to come through on that promise? We can take it to the bank. God will deliver. Now, this series is going to be, we're going to be spending our time all four weeks in the gospel of Luke. It's one of my favorite gospels. I have four favorite gospels, by the way. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're all in the New Testament. And we're going to be in chapters 1 and 2 in the Gospel of Luke. 
So this morning, we're going to be in chapter 1, verses 67 through 79. You can turn there. And as you make your way there, let me catch you up to speed on what's happened in Luke's gospel so far. See, Luke introduces us to this, this guy's priest. His name's Zachariah, and he's hanging out at the temple. He's doing his temple work, and He's been selected to be the one to go inside of the temple and perform duties inside. Like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Not every priest got to do this. But on this day, Zechariah gets to do it. Zechariah is an old man. Zechariah had been praying long in his past that God would give him and his wife, Elizabeth, a son. Elizabeth was barren, they were unable to have children. And he had prayed some time ago that God would grant them a son. Well, he goes into the temple that morning, and when he gets in there, there is an angel standing there before him. Now, this freaked him out. In fact, every time an angel shows up to talk with people, people get freaked out. So if you were in here, like you walked in here thinking, I would love to see an angel someday, I'm just saying you haven't read the Bible I don't think you do, because every time they say, don't be afraid. You know why they say, don't be afraid? Because they were afraid. So he walks in, and he sees this angel. He's terrified. He's probably thinking to himself, I did something wrong in the ceremonial washing. I have now breathed my last breath. I will die. But the angel's like, fear not. Don't worry. It's all good. Just relax. It's going to be okay. And then he says, God has heard your prayer. That is an amazing statement because you're going to find out in a little bit that Zechariah, he wasn't sure that God had heard that prayer. He had been praying it a long time ago and then, and then the angel says that you and your wife, you're going to have a baby. And his answer to that is like, how's that possible? I'm old my wife is old. We don't know how old they are, but they're well beyond childbearing years. They're probably in their 60s, maybe 70s. Like, they're way outside of this idea of chasing a little toddler around. He's like, how in the world is this even possible? Which his answer to the, the declaration from the angel tells me that this prayer that he had prayed that God would give them a, a, a baby was long gone. He's like, how is this possible? And because he asked the question, how is it possible? I mean, he's a priest. He should have known that through God, all things are possible. This is no big deal at all. He says, I'm going to close your mouth. You're not going to be able to speak until the baby is born. And that's exactly what happens. This encounter with the angel lasts a really long time. The people on the outside are like, uh-oh, <laughs> Zachariah did something bad. He ain't making it out of this thing alive. He walks out of there and he starts making motions and gestures. I don't know what those might look like. Like, <laughs> like I don't know what the gestures like. That would have been one game of charades, right? Like, he makes gestures to them like they could tell he had seen an angel. And sure enough, Elizabeth, his wife, becomes pregnant. And then there's another promise made, the foretelling of Jesus, the one we celebrate at Christmas time, to this angel comes to Mary, who had never been with man. She was she was like engaged to be married to Joseph, but had never been with a man before. And he says that you're going to you're going to give birth to the Savior. And she's like, "How is this possible? Like, I've never been with a man before. This isn't even biologically possible." And the angel says, "Don't worry, it's going to happen." She says, "Hey." Whatever it looks like, I'm all in. And I love how the author of Luke contrasts these two different scenarios right together. In fact, rather than contrasting, it's comparative. So you take this one couple who are too old to have kids, and you take this young girl who is too young, meaning she's never been with a man before, and there's this promise made that they're both going to bear children. It's a beautiful picture. And then the story goes on. Mary goes up to be with her cousin Elizabeth. Elizabeth sees Mary in the baby inside of her womb, leaps like, oh, this is awesome. The baby inside of Elizabeth's womb comes to be John 
the Baptist. That happens because when the baby is born, they're going to name him something from the family line, like Zachariah can't talk. And they're going to name him a different name. And, and Elizabeth's like, no, 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 his name's going to be John. They're like, his name can't be John. There's no John in your family line. That's not how we do things. She's like, no, no. So they, they motion to Zachariah, and Zachariah's like, no, his name is going to be John. He's acting in obedience to what God had commanded him based on this son. He says his name is going to be John. And as soon as he declares his name to be John, all of a sudden his mouth is opened up, and he can begin to talk. And the people, it says, the people in the town, very curious about what in the world is going on right now. This is wild. And they just sat there in wonder, sat there wondering, what is this all about? What is this all going to mean? And we pick up the story in chapter 1, verse 67. And this is what it says. Then his father, Zechariah, was still with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He sent us a mighty savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he had promised through his holy prophets long ago. Now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies so we can serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare a way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. I want to pause there just briefly. So in those two verses, Zechariah is specifically talking to the son whom he is holding, John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. He's holding him and he's declaring over him what had been said about John 700 years beforehand. You can read about it in Isaiah chapter 40 or in Malachi chapter 3, this foretelling of somebody who will go before the Messiah and be the front runner or the forerunner, declaring who this Messiah is or who he's going to be. So, so Zechariah is talking specifically to John in those two verses. And then he goes on to say, because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is, break, is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. I picture Zechariah holding on to his eight-day-old son filled with so many emotions. I remember we have four kids and I remember each one of their births and as You hold them after it's all said and done, just the emotions that you're filled with. In fact, at the birth of our firstborn, the people that were in the waiting room, they weren't sure if I was crying happy cries or sad cries. They were afraid something was going on because I was like ugly crying. You guys know it does not take me much to cry. I cry at supermarket openings. I cry at Hallmark movies. Like, if I want to compliment somebody, my, e- my tears start, start to well up. I really don't like it. It just happens. I can't do anything about it. So I imagine for Zechariah, right, this is a promise. This was a prayer so long ago, and he's standing there holding his baby, and God had promised, and he didn't know how it was all going to come together, just filled with so many emotions. But that's not all he was filled with. The scriptures say that he was also filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And he begins to prophesy. And it's very interesting that out of these 11 verses, that only two of them are in reference to the baby that he is holding. All of the other ones, nine other verses are in reference to the one who is coming. Like, thankfully, they didn't have like camcorders back then. So John the Baptist didn't have to relive this in the moment where his dad's holding him. He's talking about somebody else. 
focuses on him for a couple of verses, but all of his attention is focused somewhere else. And the reason why John, uh, Zacharias' focus was somewhere else is because they were standing on the threshold of someone far greater than John the Baptist. They were standing on the threshold of the Savior coming into the world. In fact, Jesus himself says, of all the, all the people born of a woman, John, there is none greater than John the Baptist. So Zechariah is holding the greatest of all. You thought you were good. You're not as good as John the Baptist. He's holding him. And he's talking about the one who is yet to come, the one who is on his way, this person, Jesus, the one whom we celebrate at Christmas. You see, Christmas is a celebration of the fulfillment of a 4,000-year-old promise. Wrestle with that for a minute. At Christmas, we celebrate the fulfillment of a 4,000-year-old promise. The promise, the Messiah, promise of the Christ, promise of the Savior of the world. And people had been waiting 4,000 years for the promise. That's wild, isn't it? I have a hard time waiting four minutes for something, <laughs> let alone four months. Four years, forget about it. 4,000 years, are you kidding me right now? 4,000 years they had been waiting for this promised Savior, this Messiah who is coming into the world. I can't even get my mind wrapped around it. And that season of waiting is what is called Advent. And Advent, in fact, is something that the church celebrates today. Today is day one of the Advent season. The Advent, easiest way to get your mind around it or to remember is just simply this expectant waiting. Waiting with expectation that something is going to be fulfilled. Something is going to come. Up until the birth of Jesus, they were waiting for him to come. They were in what's called the first Advent. Expectant waiting of the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior to come. As the church, we are in what's called the second advent, where we await his return. And every year, December, it gives us an opportunity to pause and to focus, not on all the gifts and all the rapping and all the songs, all of that is wonderful. The busyness of Christmas is wonderful. But if we miss the focal point of Christmas, we've missed it all. And that's why our desire is to, in the midst of the busy, to not lose sight of our focus, to focus in on Jesus. So this season is an opportunity for us to pause in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us with expectant hope for what Jesus has yet to do. You see, the promises that Jesus fulfilled in his birth give us great confidence that he is going to fulfill the promises he has not yet fulfilled. And that's what Advent season is all about, is to lean in and focus on Jesus with hopeful expectation of what he has yet to do. So I encourage you today, you could do this so easily. It's just a quick Google search or Bing or whatever, you know, search browser you want to use, Safari. And just type in like some, some uh, 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 um, Advent readings. Focus in. Advent scriptures to read. It'll give you a list of scriptures that you can read this Advent season to really focus your attention. Or maybe for these four weeks, you're going to take time and you're going to read Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, and you're just going to read it over and over and over. And if your Bible has some cross-references at the bottom or in the middle section that you're going to cross right and you're going to go back and you're going to read. And by the end of today, I'm going to give you a ton of homework. So if you're not sure where to read, I'm going to give you lots of stuff that you can read in order to focus your attention on who Jesus is in this Advent season. So what I want to do for the rest of our time together is I want to trace this promise all the way back to the beginning. 
Like I said, this is a 4,000 year old promise. So I want to take it all the way back to the beginning. So get your pen, pa- get your pen and paper ready so that you can write down these verses because I'm not going to read them all to you, but it's an opportunity for you to go back and take your own journey through the text and realize that the Bible is one story that all points to Jesus. It all points to Jesus. And I get a ton of grief, especially in our men's Bible study, and it's all for fun, but it always goes back to Genesis for me. Like every conversation, we end up back in Genesis, so they, they, they make fun of me, really. Um, and they're like, are you out of Genesis yet over there when I'm asking questions? And this is why it's so powerful to me. It's for a ton of my life growing up as I gave my heart to Christ when I was 12 years old, and then I was raised in a church that just primarily preached topically, I didn't realize that the Bible was one unifying story that all pointed to Jesus. And when I finally made that connection, it radically changed the way I engaged the text. It gave me more confidence. It gave me more hope. I recognized these aren't individual stories that are just happen to land in between two leather-bound pieces of Bible, that this is actually one story that God had been stretching out for thousands of years for us. So my hope is, as we start to string these things together, that it builds your confidence, that it builds your hope, that you recognize that when God promises, that God delivers. So this promise starts all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 13, God had already created the world, said it was beautiful. He, 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 he filled it with animals and, and sea beans and birds and all sorts of stuff. And then the crown of his creation is humanity, and he breathes them into life, creates them from the dust of the ground, and then breathes life into them. And he's in perfect unity and relationship with them. And he's given them so much at their disposal. But he says, hey, there's one thing that you can't do. The tree there in the middle, do not eat from that. You can't eat from that tree. And they ate from the tree. One rule. All the things that they had at their fingertips, and they decided to do the one thing they're not supposed to do. I'm guilty, okay? Guilty of the same thing. And God comes down, and he has a conversation. And he has a conversation with the serpent who deceived him. He has a conversation with Eve, and he has a conversation with Adam. So I encourage you to go back and look at this in its context. Read through math, uh, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And in the midst of it, God makes a promise to the serpent that his head would be crushed one day by the offspring of the woman. So one day, your head will be crushed. You might get a strike in. You might bite him. And that's why Jesus is called the wounded victor. You might, you might bite him, but in the end, you get destroyed. Now, this promise, it's beautiful. It's vague. And it's a bit mysterious. It's easy, actually, to just read over it if you're reading quickly through the text. And you pause, right? It's beautiful. It's vague. Like, what does this mean? On our side of salvation history, it's easier to look back and see what it means. But I can imagine for the first audience, well, this is kind of interesting. It's curious. And it's mysterious. Until later in the story, when God makes another promise to a guy named Abram. Abram, you probably recognize him as Abraham. Remember Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham? I am one of them and so are you. You guys remember the song? Well, yeah, exactly. And we run into Abram in uh, chapter 12, roughly, of the book of Genesis. But in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, God makes a promise to Abram. He says, Leave your town, leave your native land. I'm going to send you to another land. And in that land, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Now, this is also very interesting because Abraham's story is a lot like Zachariah's story. Abraham and his wife, Sarah, they couldn't have kids. How in the world are you going to bring a nation from me if I can't have kids? Well, God can do whatever he wants. When God promises, God delivers. And that's exactly what happens. And he promises Abraham, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and then again in chapter 22, verses 15 through 18, that God is going to make him into a great nation. The promises are essentially this. I will bless you and your descendants. And I will use them to bring goodness and blessing to all the other nations. That's God's promise to Abraham. 
I'll make you into a great nation. I will bless them, and they will be a blessing to every other nation around the world. Well, God certainly comes through on his promise, and Abraham has a son, has a couple of sons. Abraham has uh, 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 Ishmael and Isaac, and Isaac is the one of promise. And then Isaac, he has a couple of sons as well named Esau and Jacob. And Jacob is the son of promise. When you read through Genesis, it keeps narrowing the story down to God's promise and the way that God's going to bring his promise about. So he keeps narrowing down. Jacob, he wrestles with God and he gets the name Israel. And then Jacob has 12 sons. 12 sons, 12 tribes of Israel. All of a sudden, you can see this family tree starting to branch off pretty fast. You can start to see how God is going to turn this one man, Abraham, into a great nation. And then one of the 12 sons that Jacob or Israel has, his name is Judah. And God makes a promise to Judah in Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 12. Read it sometime this week. So this is Abraham's great grandson. It's one of his descendants. And the promise that God makes to Judah is a great king will come from your line. So you see how God is already working out his promises? He's already fulfilling his promises along the way. He tells Judah, a great king will come from your line. The one who will destroy evil and fulfills all of God's promises to Abraham is going to come out of you, Judah, and through your descendants, the one who will bring blessing to all the nations around the world is going to come through you. And then you fast forward the tape another six, 700 years, and we run into the second king of Israel, but the first king to come out of the line of Judah. And his name is King David. King David was a wonderful man. He had a great start, seems to have a good finish, but the middle section was atrocious. And with King David's, like, great start, the people around had to wonder, is this the one? Is this the one? Is this the promised one? Is this the Messiah that had promised to us long ago? Is he the one that's going to fulfill? Is he the one that's going to eradicate evil and bring goodness and blessing to every nation on there? Is it him? Is he going to destroy evil? And then you can read about King David's horrible fall, where he doesn't destroy evil, but rather is destroyed by evil. He doesn't eradicate sin. In fact, he dives headlong into it. And it has to leave people around like, okay, when is this king? If King David wasn't the one, when is the king coming who is going to eradicate evil and bring blessing and restore blessing and goodness to the world? When is that king going to come? Their hopes had to have been dashed. They got so excited and then hopes dashed. And every one of us in this room, we've had those moments of great elation thinking that a promise was going to be fulfilled, only to be let down by it. In fact, some of us in this room today are listening online, we're currently pursuing a promise that can never fulfill for us. We've all heard of the saying or the old adage, right? When you're climbing the corporate ladder, make sure it's leaning against the right building. Because so often you get to the top of the ladder only to realize I've been against the wrong building. Because the promise that it made early on could not fulfill in the end of it all. So we're all familiar with our hopes being dashed, having great excitement around an event or a promise only to be let down in the future. But despite man's failures, God keeps his promises. Remember, God promises and God delivers. King David could not bring about the promises that the people around him hoped he did. He failed. Where people fail, God prevails. Although man fails, God keeps his promises. And so God makes another promise. And he makes a promise to King David. And you can read about this 
in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And this is his promise. That the king that they have been waiting for all of their lives, since the beginning of Israel's history, will come through the line of David. He makes a promise to Abraham. He makes a promise to Judah. He makes a promise to David. And all of these promises are focused in on one person, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. You see, the Old Testament is full of these kings. You can read about all of these kings. Like king after king after king failed to be the fulfilled promise that they're waiting for and hoping for. You can read 1 Kings and 2 Kings, and you will read two very disturbing books. I encourage you to do it. These two books lay out king after king after king who failed to be the king that they were waiting for, the king that they were hoping for. And the Old Testament ends with no king fulfilling this promised Messiah, the one who would destroy evil, end it, and bring about goodness and blessing. And then throughout all of the Old Testament, we have these guys named prophets. And the prophets would come along, and the prophets would, would give a prophecy of judgment over the nation, but generally coupled with it was a promise of the Messiah who is coming. There is hope. There is hope. There is hope. And we see it over and over again. And one of the, one of the prophets who, who talks the most about the Messiah coming is this prophet named Isaiah. This prophet Isaiah, he kept telling God's people and reminding them of God's promises. And this, uh, the prophet Isaiah, he spoke the most about the coming Messiah. So I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter nine and we're gonna read verse two together. I love the book of Isaiah. It's a very challenging one to read, but there is so much packed into it. And this is what the prophet Isaiah tells God's people about God's promises. Isaiah chapter nine, verse two says this, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in the land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Does that sound familiar? This was a part of Zachariah's prayer. We just read that earlier. That was in verses 78 and 79. Zechariah uses almost the identical words as the prophet Isaiah, 700 years later, he begins to say the same thing. Zechariah was linking the birth of Jesus to Isaiah's prophecy. Therefore, linking the birth of Jesus to a 4,000-year-old promise of a Messiah who is going to come. It's mind-boggling, isn't it? If a human being tried to put this together, we would fail miserably, but the God of the universe has been stringing this story together throughout all of eternity. It's 4,000 year old promise. So Jesus is the fulfillment of a 4,000 year old promise. How cool is that? It's incredible, in fact, It's not just a 4,000-year-old promise because in the book of Ephesians, chapter one, I believe it's verse four, Paul, who wrote the book of Ephesians, he tells us that this was God's plan before the foundation of the world was ever set. So God creates this world knowing that one day he would send his son to do what? To eradicate evil and to bring about the blessings and the goodness that God had planned for humanity all along. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise. God promises and God delivers. He is, as as Zachariah says, he is the morning light that shines into the darkness to rescue us from evil and to restore goodness and to restore blessing to people. Who is it that sits in darkness? everybody who has not bowed their knee to Jesus as Savior. We sit in darkness. Those who have not surrendered to the Lordship of Christ sit in darkness. Everyone who has not put their hope and trust in Jesus sits in darkness. 
But Jesus came, and he, became, and he came because he was chasing after you. If you're here this morning and you have not put your faith and hope and trust in Jesus yet, he came, stepped out of eternity, joined humanity because he was coming after you. And he was coming after me. And when we surrender to his lordship, we step out of the darkness and we step into this morning light. And the beautiful part about that promise is Jesus promises to be the king that every other king failed to be. Every other king that you've put your hope and your trust in, it will fail you if it is not Jesus. But Jesus promises to be the king that every other king has failed to be. Now, we might not call them kings, but we are all pursuing something with our lives. We've bought a promise somewhere along the line, whether it's our 401k, whether it's our career, whether it's, whether it's the relationships that we have, the children that we have, the material uh, things that we have, we're pursuing something. We not, not, again, we might not call them kings, but that's exactly what they are. We're hoping they will deliver on their promises. They can't, but Jesus can, and that's why he came. So I have a question for you as we begin to wrap things up here. Where have you deposited your trust? Where have you put your trust? And this Advent season is a great time for you to process that question. Where have you deposited your trust? Now, you might think that that's a question just for those who are not believers in this room, but it's not. It's a question that we as believers, we have to come back to time and time again. Where have I placed my trust Is my trust right now misplaced? Am I hoping for things that cannot come through on their promises? In the Advent season, this opportunity for us to pause and to focus our attention is a great opportunity to ask and answer this question. Where have I deposited my trust? I want to read just a little bit more of Isaiah chapter 9. Because in it, we can see what this promise looks like for those who put their trust in it, or rather, in him. And it's Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. It says this, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and his government and peace will never end end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make it happen. God promises and God delivers. If we could have the worship team come at this time. We all have and continue to put our hope and promises in things, in institutions, in places, and in people that cannot come through on their promises. Christmas is a great opportunity for us to assess the, the, the trust structures that we have in our life. Where is our trust? It's an opportunity to evaluate where is our focus? Where has our focus Ben, this morning, we're going to receive communion in response to this message. Because in communion, it's a time where we focus our attention on Jesus. We focus in on him in a couple of different ways. We focus in on him by looking back at our redeemed past for those who are believers, thinking of all of the shenanigans we've pulled. All of the ways that we have sinned, all of the things that if we could go back and do it different, we would. And can say, thank you, Jesus, that because of the work you did on the cross, I'm not bound to those things anymore. They have no hold on me. I've been forgiven of those things. And when we pause to receive communion, it's a moment for us to pause and say, Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you that you have redeemed my path. You have forgiven me of my sins. 
And it's also a time for us to look forward with hopeful, hopeful expectation. It's the second advent. We are waiting for Jesus to fulfill the promises he has not yet fulfilled. Not yet fulfilled. So this morning as we come to communion, focusing our attention on Jesus, the band is going to play behind, and we're just going to take a moment to sit individually and process our redeemed past and our hopeful future. Focusing our attention on who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he is still going to do. And then in a minute, I'll pray and we'll receive communion together. Jesus, this morning, we pause and we focus our attention on you around communion and all that it symbolizes. And this morning, as we hold this bread in our hands, we do so thinking of your body that was bruised and broken for us. It was a punishment that we deserved, but that you bore. And you took our place and you bore our shame and you took our penalty. This morning, we want to say thank you for doing that. Let's receive the bread. And as we hold this cup, it represents your blood that was poured out. And the scriptures tell us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so it was our blood that was supposed to be poured out. But yours was in our place. And this morning, we want to say thank you for doing that for us. Let's receive the cup. And as we receive this communion, Lord, with gratefulness of what you did in our redeemed past, focus our eyes on what you've yet to do. Help us to anchor our hope and our trust in you and in you alone. And for those of us who are here and we identify as followers of you, Christians, believers, Help us not to assume that our trust is anchored firmly in you. If there are some areas that we're putting trust and hope in that just cannot deliver, Lord, during this season, would you refocus our attention on you? Get our, firm, our feet firmly fixed to you. For those who are here with us today and they have not yet made a decision to follow you as Lord and Savior, trust you as king of their lives. I pray that they would make a decision today to bow their knee and surrender to you, Lord. To your name we pray these things, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand to your feet this morning? I've got one takeaway, and then the band's going to play one more song, opportunity for us to process what we've heard today. Maybe you came in and you need somebody to pray with you about anything. We're going to have some friends up in the front. They would love to pray with you before we leave today. If you're here and you've not yet made a decision to follow Jesus, but you want to, or at least you want to talk about what that looks like, I would love to have a conversation with you before you leave today. I'm going to be up front. I know it would take a bold decision to step out of your seat and to walk down and have a conversation, but I guarantee you it will be the best decision of your life. And I'll be right up here, and I'd love to chat with you before you. I'd love to pray with you before you leave today. So here's my one takeaway, and then the band's going to play. Don't miss the real focus 
Thanks for tuning in. This concludes today's message. New sermon podcasts are uploaded by Tuesday of each week. We'd also love to invite you to our live gatherings each Sunday at 10 a.m. Our gatherings are also streamed live on YouTube and Facebook each week. On behalf of the Canvas Church team, we hope you have a great week, and we'll catch you next time.